My name's Catherine Sout and I'm the Gynae Clinical Lead at um, Counties Manuka. And I'm going to talk today about pelvic masses and also tie that in with referral guidelines and the faster cancer time triaging and what we're doing with faster cancer time and how that you can help us with that at the hospital to get the best results for your patients. Um, so just talking about pelvic masses, there's lots of different locations within the pelvis and causes of a pelvic mass. And these can be divided up by anatomical location, so ovary, fallopian tube, uterus, and also gastrointestinal, which um, aren't necessarily gyne gynecological, but need to be on your radar. So in the ovary, we get functional cysts, we can get endometriosis, there can be neoplasms, benign or malignant, or ectopic pregnancies. In the fallopian tube, again, ectopic pregnancies, tube ovarian abscesses, hydrosalpinks, neoplasms, or tuberculosis, which we still see occasionally. And of course, in the uterus, which you can um, get pregnancy, not to forget, um, myomas and sarcomas, and then the gastrointestinal causes, which are different abscesses or tumours. So they can also be divided up by age. So if you see in an infant, you really do get, but you can occasionally get adnexal cysts from in utero hormones. Um, in puberty, we sometimes see a vaginal mass in pelvic pain and something on an ultrasound, which can be a hematocolpus, which is from an perforate hymen. And so that's the presentation where a young adolescent is late onset of menarche and gets cyclical pain, not to forget that. And then in the reproductive age, the common ones are pregnancy, fibroids, functional ovarian cysts, and then other ovarian masses, benign or malignants, or infections. And then the most common cause in the postmenopausal group, of course, is cancer and needs to be ruled out. So if we're looking specifically at ovary, the non-neoplastic tumours of the ovary include follicular or inclusion cysts, corpus luteal cysts, pregnancy luteoma or endometrioma, and neoplasms also originate from the surface epithelium of the ovary, <coughs> Excuse me, and they can be serous cyst adenoma or mucinous cyst adenoma or carcinoma if they're malignant. And neoplasms are rising from the stroma of the ovary, which are fibroma and burner tumour, and both of those can occasionally become malignant as well. And germ cell tumours, which are the dermoids. And again, they can sometimes be malignant. So when you see a patient and you um, assessing for a pelvic mass, the important thing is first of all, the most important thing is the history in the beginning, and it's important to take a history including is the pain chronic or acute, do they get cyclical symptoms, do they get dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and it's very important to examine these patients, and this can sometimes be challenging in our population because we have some very large BMIs, but uh, doing a bimanual examination is an important part of the assessment. And in a patient with a normal BMI, you can generally distinguish between a uterine mass, which is a fibroid, or an adnexal, a benign adnexal mass or a malignant adnexal mass, because um, a benign adnexal mass will be soft, fluctuant, and move separate to the uterus, whereas the malignant ones will be a harder, firmer, and sometimes it is harder to differentiate them from a fibroid. And then the next thing is the investigations. And obviously in a reproductive age woman, you need to do a pregnancy test and the very important investigation is a transvaginal ultrasound. And if there is an adnexal mass, then to help further dif differentiate between benign or malignant, those tumour markers are a useful part of the workup. If you think in a premenopausal woman that there is an adnexal, um, a malignant, possible malignancy with a complex mass, it's important to do um, the tumour markers. So just some pictures. This is a functional ovarian cyst, um, and it's a normal finding in a reproductive age woman. And the imaging there shows some hemorrhage within that cyst. And these are very common, and nothing needs to be done about them. This is a hydrosalpinx, which is also quite common. And typical ultrasound appearance, which almost looks like a caterpillar with um, little wastes along it. And that's very characteristic of an it's caused from collection of fluid within a fallopian tube, most commonly from um, an STI. And this is a picture of a paratubal cyst, which again is, comes from malarian remnants and is also a very common finding, is often an incidental finding when you do a laparoscopy, but sometimes again they contort and give pain. And this is the classic dermoid, 
which um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, that has the um, hair and teeth and it looks really quite ugly when you cut it open. And the ultrasound appearance with the classic nodule in the middle and then you can see the debris within the um, actual cyst itself. And one of the most urgent things with the ovarian cyst, of course, is if they taut and because that can result in loss of the ovary if it's not urgent gynaecological help is not sought. And here's some pictures of some simple cysts at laparoscopy. And this is a picture of a malignant cyst. So you can see it's got the classic appearance internally of lots of little um, nodules and irregular and hard. So looking at scans, this is a classic benign ovarian mass, which is big fluid-filled sac with not much in the way of irregularity, no nodules, and um, just looks like a big empty bag. And by contrast, an ultrasound of a malignant cyst, which you see there's lots of little nodules and there's blood flow going to the nodular area. So looking at the, the characteristics of a benign versus a malignant cyst, so benign, generally, they unilocular cysts. If there are solid components, they are very small. Um, you can get shadowing within them. And generally, they are less than 10 centimetres in diameter with no blood flow. Whereas malignant, often the tumours are irregular with solid areas, often associated with ascites. They will often have papillary structures within them and the irregular multilocular solid tumour is often bigger than 10 centimetres and they have a good blood flow. And once we get referred these cysts, we use the risk of malignancy index to help us assess whether it's likely to be benign or malignant. So we look at the ultrasound and we look at the menopausal status and we look at the tumour marker, the CA125. So for example, you get more points if you're postmenopausal and you get the higher your CA125, the more points you get. So an RMI of more than 200 is almost certainly a gynaecological malignancy. And a RMI of between 120 and 200 is, the, is in moderate risk and gynaecological referral is recommended. So when you get ovarian cysts coming to see you, some woman with an ovarian cyst in your surgery, how do you manage them and what do you do? So any woman with a confirmed ovarian cyst on a scan who has symptoms that aren't responding to simple analgesia, you need to discuss with the acute gynaecologist of the day. And we have a clear guideline for you all to um, refer to, it's available for everyone to refer to, of what to do with these cysts. So if in a reproductive age woman, a simple follicular cyst that's less than or equal to three centimetres, almost certainly benign and often even not reported by the radiologist, and no action is needed. In the reproductive age, a corpus luteal cyst, similar, no action is required. And in a postmenopausal cyst, a simple cyst less than two centimetres, less than equal to two centimetres, is common, unimportant, and does not need any referral or follow-up. So moving on to larger cysts with benign characteristics, a simple cyst, which is extra ovarian or ovarian, with no solid component or septations and no blood flow, and the reproductive age group less than five centimetres needs no follow-up and no referral. And a postmenopausal woman, between two centimetres and five centimetres, we would suggest you do tumour tumor markers. If the tumour markers are normal, repeat the scan in four to six months, and then if there's no change on the ultrasound, then no action is required. If there is change on the scan, it's grown, or the CA125 is abnormal, then they need referral through to a gynaecologist. And all ages greater than or equal to five centimetres is a guide for referral. So then a hemorrhagic cyst, they have the characteristic reticular pattern of internal echoes, as in the picture I showed you before. They can sometimes have a small solid area, but they have no blood flow. If they're symptomatic, they should be referred through to the gynaecologist. If they're asymptomatic in a reproductive age group less than five centimetres, no follow-up is needed. If they're greater than or equal to five centimetres, a repeat scan in six to eight weeks should be done to ensure resolution, and if it hasn't resolved, then refer. And women over 45 years old and postmenopausal women, if they're less, hemorrhagic cysts less than five centimetres could have a six to eight week follow-up, and greater than five centimetres needs to be referred through to the gynaecologist. 
So endometriomas, they have often have a typical appearance. They have homogeneous, low-level internal echoes that look like little spots on the scan. They don't have solid components, and they can sometimes have some small echogenic foci around the wall. And any age greater than three centimetres or symptomatic, uh, you should refer through to the gynaecologist, but less than three centimetres, they don't need referral. So dermoid cysts, and they have a characteristic appearance on ultrasound, and um, they are diffuse hyperechoic components. They often have a, a specific nodule within, and there's areas of shadowing, but again, no internal flow. Less than two centimetres of dermoid doesn't need referral, and you can discharge, no follow-up required. Two to five centimetres, they don't need referral to a gynaecologist, but a repeat scan in a year to, to confirm stability. And then greater than five centimetres, we would recommend referral to a gynaecologist. And so moving on to hydrocell pinks, these are the short tubulate-shaped cystic lesions that appear like a caterpillar on an ultrasound, and really it's is clinically indicated. So if the family is complete and asymptomatic, they don't really need to be seen. But if they're desiring fertility or they get symptoms, then they should be referred through. Then moving on to the cysts that have indeterminate but probably benign characteristics. So you get a finding suggestive but not classic for a hemorrhagic cyst or an endometrioma or a dermoid. You need to, um, if they're premenopausal, consider if they're asymptomatic, because obviously if they're symptomatic, they need referral. If they're asymptomatic, rescan them in six to eight weeks. Um, and if a gynaecological referral is recommended if they're symptomatic or more than three centimetres. And all postmenopausal women with a indeterminate cyst should be referred through to a gynaecologist. Thin walled cysts, follow up for simple, as for a simple cyst based on the size or menopausal status. And multiple septations, again, should be considered for a gynaecological referral. And then cysts with a malignant appearance, they usually quite characteristic on an ultrasound. They have thick, irregular septations, nodules with blood flow, and associated free fluid, which would be indicative of, indicative of a mental or peritoneal disease. And they all need to have tumour markers done and referred through to a gynaecologist. So I now want to talk to you a little bit about faster cancer time and triaging for that, because most of you probably know the Ministry of Health have set up these guidelines for us and these parameters <coughs> to assess cancers patients with a high suspicion of cancer within a certain time frame. So there's a 62-day pathway, which from 62 days from receipt of referral from the GP to the first cancer treatment. And the ministry guideline is that we manage to fulfil this criteria with 85% of our patients. And then there's a 31-day pathway from the decision to treat, so that's from when we receive a positive diagnosis of a cancer histologically to the first cancer treatment. Um, we are measuring these parameters within counties and across the country and we're all failing miserably. And um, gynaecological cancers are quite complicated and sometimes leave multi-steps to actually achieve a diagnosis. So just to tell you a little bit more about who we include in the 62-day pathway. So as I said, it's patients whose GP who have referred, referred them and they have been graded by the gynaecologist as a high suspicion of cancer. And they're also acute admissions who have a diagnosis of cancer on the ward and then they're followed up in the gynae clinic. And then in the 31-day pathway, it's an incidental finding of a cancer not graded as a high suspicion of cancer and they're admitted on the pathway at the point of positive histology. So, and it's also diagnosis of cancer at initial referral. So, if the diagnosis has been made by a GP or a private specialist, they go on the 31-day pathway. And if cancer has been diagnosed via a screening program, for example, cervical screening, or if it's a recurrence of cancer. So we really need your help in the hospital to get sent these referrals and mark certain people with a high suspicion of cancer, because as you're probably most of you are familiar with e-referrals, and the only way, we sometimes get 200 e-referrals sitting in an inbox and we are unable to differentiate between urgent and not urgent unless you tick them as urgent with a little red asterisk. And it can take up to four or five minutes sometimes to grade each referral, so you can imagine how much time it takes to grade 100 referrals. So we really need your help, and anyone that fulfils these red flags that are likely to have a cancer, we need you to mark as urgent. And the counter side of that is 
please, if people are urgent and the patient's just got a bit of pelvic pain but they've got a normal ultrasound, they're not really as urgent as these women. So please don't mark them as urgent. Maybe make a point in the referral that they are finding difficulty coping with their daily life, but they are not truly urgent. So, um, these are the things we want you to look for in the patients and then mark the referrals as urgent. So any biopsy proven or cytological positive malignancy, obviously, and gestational trophoblastic disease. A visible abnormality suspicious of a vulval vaginal or cervical cancer, such as an exophytic ulcerating or irregular pigmented lesion. Significant symptoms, including abnormal vaginal bleeding with abnormal clinical findings suspicious of a malignancy. So that's lymphadenopathy, vaginal nodularity, or pelvic impduration. So it's not just heavy vaginal bleeding. Postmenopausal bleeding. Now we actually, uh, the guidelines from the National Guyanese Cancer Group is that we grade all postmenopausal bleeders with an ultrasound endometrial thickness of five millimetres or more of high, is high suspicion of cancer. So they all need to be marked as urgent, even though in reality only about 10% of them will have cancer. But they need to go through that triage, which is why it's very important for you as GPs to pre present them and um, refer them with the ultrasound. Otherwise, we're unable to grade them effectively. The next thing is a rapidly growing pelvic mass or lump or woman with a pelvic or incidentally found pelvic mass, including any large complex ovarian mass more than eight centimetres, or any ovarian cyst with a malignant appearance, and as I described in the previous slides. So that's thick irregular septations, vascularity, nodules, associated free fluid, peritoneal or a mental disease, or any ovarian cyst with abnormal tumour markers. So it's really good if you can get into the habit of doing tumour markers on these women before you can refer them, before you refer them, so we can triage them appropriately. And the other thing is women with a documented genetic risk who have a suspicious pelvic abnormality or symptoms. So I've gone through the variety of pelvic masses and hopefully given you some guidelines on how to refer these women. And I just want to give, run through a couple of cases with you of not so urgent and an urgent um, case. So a 43-year-old presented for a cervical smear. She didn't have any specific complaints except her periods were quite heavy, but they were regular. And on examination, she had a bulky uterus, and she had a transvaginal scan with this picture. So does anyone know what that is? It's a, it's a fibroid. So it's a not so urgent um, mass. You can see the endometrial stripe with a calcified fibroid just in the posterior wall there. So fibroids are the most common benign uterine tumour. Most are asymptomatic, however, can present with excessive uterine bleeding symptoms, leading to secondary pressure on the bladder and rectum and distortion of the uterine cavity, leading to miscarriage or infertility. And large irregular uterus may be found on examination, and a woman may be anemic with amenorrhagia. Pelvic ultrasound usually shows well-circumscribed tumours. They don't require any treatment if they're asymptomatic, but annual follow-up is advised because a rapidly growing fibroid can be indicative of sarcomatous change. If symptomatic, definitive treatment is usually surgical, including a hysterectomy, or um, fertility, is, fertility is desired, a myomectomy to preserve fertility. But non-surgical treatments include management with non-steroidals, hormonal treatments, marinas are often effective with small fibroids, uterine artery embolisation, and occasionally GnRH hormone agonists. So another 32-year-old with menstrual pain who has classic symptom dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia and dyskesia, and on examination she had a retroverted fixed tender uterus with bilateral adnexal masses. Classic presentation for endometriosis. Again, it's not urgent, but the patients can perceive it's urgent because they can often in a lot of pain. These are the imaging findings on this woman. Classic endometrioma, which is just a fluid, uh, the, the blood-filled chocolate cyst, and on the MRI there is involvement of the rectum and the uterosacral. And these are pictures at laparoscopy of endometriosis involving the pelvis. And the third case is a 57-year-old Maori woman who, got, who presented to ICU with chest pain, shortness of breath, hypertension, CTPA had multiple PEs, was managed for that and discharged three weeks later on anticoagulation. Her abdominal examination was apparently normal. And then she came back three weeks later 
with an infected umbilicus. It was found to look like this. And six months later, sorry. And on at surgery, it was noted to have this large cyst. So the moral of that story is always beware of um, increased BMI and abdominal pain, and it's difficult to diagnose these things, and if any doubt, you're better to get imaging and see. So hopefully I've just given you a bit of a framework with pelvic masses of how to refer them, and it would be great if we can get some help with the faster cancer times. We're under a lot of pressure, as are you all under a lot of pressure. And if we can work together in this, hopefully we'll get a faster transition for those patients and hopefully expedite their care. Thank you.